good to be with all of you. Good to be in God's house in His presence, and I'm excited to share with you uh, from God's Word. And so before we get into God's Word, let's just spend time praying and asking God to ready our hearts, uh, because He knows that we need a soft heart if we want the Word of God to land on our hearts, right? We can't have a hardened heart. We need a soft heart. And so let's close our eyes and let's dedicate today into His hands. Lord, we thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your truth. We pray this morning, Jesus, that you would open up our hearts to receive this truth and that you would begin to challenge and change and encourage our hearts this morning. We thank you, God, for your word. We thank you for this time together that we can be in church, that we can be built up together in faith, together as your people, your sons and your daughters. Thank you that you have a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And we just pray this morning that you would speak into our hearts. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good. This morning, church, I want to be sharing on living waters. And it was so fitting that we sang that second song that speaks about come Holy Spirit, come living water. Um, And the living water I'm talking about is found in John 4. And this is probably one of the most iconic interactions in the Bible. And it's between Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus is traveling through Samaria to get through to Galilee. And he stops at Jacob's well in Sychar for a drink and for a rest, right? He's been walking for a long time and he's like, I just need a good cold drink of water. I'm going to stop here. Now, who knows that Jesus... Does, never does anything by accident, right? Jesus never does anything by accident. He never goes to a certain place by accident. He never says anything by accident. Everything is intentional and everything is purposeful because that's who he is. He doesn't make mistakes. And so that day, Jesus knew who he would meet, who he would encounter. He knew that he needed to be at that well at that certain time of the day, to encounter this one special woman. And so we're going to watch this video to set the tone for the message this morning. Would you give me a drink? Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You a Jew. Ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan, and a woman. I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come at noon. In the heat, so you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but... I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to throw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Long story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. 
You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah. Exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him, even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit. And the time is coming and is now here. That it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth. Heart and mind, that, that is the kind of worshiper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sort this mess out, including me. I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married, but he wasn't a good man. He hurt you, and it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. You picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. <laughs> I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. <laughs> you promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Hey, wait! You what here? You forgot your um. Taxi, your man, you told me everything I ever did. <laughs> um, Rabbi, we got food. What would you like? Ah, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Who got you food? Isn't that just a beautiful depiction of John 4? 
I love that when Jesus says, I've come to break the barriers. Isn't that incredible? You know, as we travel through this, this story in John 4, I want to point out four characteristics of Jesus that I observed through the story. And you know, this message today is not necessarily a revelation message. It's not something you've maybe never heard before, but it is a reminder message. It's a reminder about who Jesus really is. And so the first point I want to go through this morning, if you're taking notes, is number one, that Jesus is unconventional. Jesus is unconventional. That word unconventional means not based on or conforming to what is generally done or believed. Let me give you some examples. Jesus hung out with and had dinner with tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes. That was unconventional. He healed people on the Sabbath day, the day of rest, the day the religious leader said you're not allowed to, but he did it anyway. He forgave people their sins and claimed that he was, in fact, the Son of God. He encouraged people to love their enemies. That's unconventional. He turned over tables because people were turning his church into a marketplace. He reached out to lepers, peoples were, people with infectious diseases, and he reached out to them. He touched them. He was with the outcast. He loved the unlovable, and he died on a cross for people who didn't even know him. In fact, he died on a cross for people who hated him. And on this day, in this story, he, Jesus, a Jew, a Jewish man, is found speaking to a Samaritan woman. Now this was unconventional in this time. It was unheard of in his day and age. In Jesus' day, harsh racial and cultural conflict existed between the Jews and the Samaritans. They were racist towards each other. They hated each other. The one, thought they were, the one side thought they were better than the other side. And so here we find a righteous Messiah, the King of Kings, coming to sit and talk with an impure woman, asking her for a drink of water. And you know that even that drink that she would offer him would have been seen as contaminated would have been seen as impure. How dare Jesus take water from this woman? It would have been seen as impure. Jews considered Samaritans, particularly their women, to be permanently unclean. Talk about racism and sexism. They considered them permanently unclean. Observers would have been shocked at this interaction. I mean, the disciples in the last verse, that as they come there, they, they, the Bible says that they are shocked that Jesus is speaking to a woman, never mind a Samaritan woman. And they had questions, but none of them dare ask Jesus. And they had questions like in their mind, like, what on earth are you doing, Jesus? This is not what we do. But Jesus is unconventional. He doesn't do what we think he's going to do. And he doesn't say the things that we think he's going to say. Jesus is not phased by what the people will say or think. He loves the outcast, the unlovable, the broken, the messed up, the ones shunned from society. He came for them. A doctor coming for the sick, right? He came for those. And I love this. One of my most favorite worship leaders, Christine DeMarco, she released a new album called The Field last year. And on this particular album, um, everything changed, you know. It was one of her albums where she just, her lyrics were so powerful and it was just so real. And on one of her songs, You Are My Country, she starts a song by saying this, maybe we will get to heaven and realize we were both wrong. Isn't that humbling? Maybe each of, each of us will get to, get to heaven and we'll realize, oh, we were actually wrong about so-and-so and so-and-so and what is he doing in heaven? But we don't know what Jesus does, and Jesus is unconventional, and we don't know a person's heart. One of her other songs is called, What If Jesus, and these are the lyrics. It says, what if Jesus is just smiling when I think down here I must know everything? And what if people I don't agree with are the same ones pouring perfume on his feet? 
What if I spend life in his vineyard and at midnight he redeems my enemies? How would you feel? What if Jesus' wedding table holds the people that have hurt and wounded me? And what if I'm seated in the middle while at the head are some who have only just believed? How would we feel? But Jesus is unconventional, right? My second point is this, is that Jesus is all-knowing yet forgiving. He's all-knowing yet forgiving. The woman at the well was not only considered impure because she was a woman, number one, she was a Samaritan, number two, but also because she was living in sin. She was immoral. She was continuously living in sin. Normally, as we saw in the video, normally people, women would come together to the well. It was actually like a social interaction. It was like, hey girls, we're going to go to the well, get our early morning fresh water. Let's all go together. Let's chat about what's happening in our lives. You know, it was friendship. It was we doing this together and they would go early in the morning so as to avoid the heat of the day. But here's this woman coming alone, which was odd alone to collect water, and at such a random time of day, at the hottest part of the day when everyone is resting or having a nap, when she knew that no one would be there to mock her, to condemn her. The fact that she was drawing water alone at midday probably indicates that she was a social outcast, that she was most likely despised by the other women and other people within her village. She's unaware of how Jesus knows her, of how he truly knows her. He knows what she's done. He knows her past. He knows her thoughts. He knows her life. He knows the situation. We saw in the video that Jesus asks her to go call her husband, and that's mentioned in John 4, verse 17 to 18. And at this revelation, the woman is shocked. He knows about my five husbands. <laughs> Jesus knows. She didn't say anything, but he knows about her sin. But here's the thing. Jesus points this out. He points out her sin not to condemn her, but rather to reveal to her that he is, in fact, the Messiah. And that he offers a better way of living. And now Jesus had her full attention. He offers her a better way of living And church, this morning, Jesus knows your story. He knows what you've been through. He knows your thought process. He knows what you're feeling. He knows what you're experiencing. He knows the hurt that you've experienced. He knows everything about you, but he's here to offer you living water, just as for this woman in the story. Which brings me to my third point is that Jesus is soul-satisfying. Jesus is soul-satisfying. In Israel, a land that frequently experienced drought, people were keenly aware of water sources and water quality. In the Jewish culture, dead water referred to water that has been standing still, that's been stored in a certain place, just like this well. It's just sitting there. Nothing is flowing. It's not living water. Or just like a pond or a, a dam that's just sitting there. And living water referred to flowing water, like a river or a spring or rainfall. And yet Jesus is offering this woman living water. John 4, 10 to 14, Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob? Um, Yes. (laughs) Who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and animals enjoyed? And Jesus replies, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So the distinction between the dead and the living water helps explain why this Samaritan woman was so perplexed. Because in Samaria, there was no permanent river. There was no permanent like water outlet. There was living water. 
And so if Jacob had to dig a well here, then who is Jesus and how could Jesus offer superior water? Well, it was because Jesus was talking about a different kind of water, not the kind she was thinking about. Jesus is the source of living water. And the the living water that he speaks about here is his Holy Spirit living and moving and working powerfully within our lives. Church, we can try and quench our thirst in all the many things that this world has to offer. And I'm sure many of us have tried. We can try to do it through money and power and relationships, pleasure, five husbands. (laughs) We can try it all, but we will never be satisfied. Nothing in this world will ever be able to satisfy or quench our thirst or our souls Only Jesus through his Holy Spirit. That void that we experience, that we feel in our hearts before we know Jesus, before we experience that living water, there's nothing on earth that could ever quench that thirst. The things in this world might temporarily make it feel like we are being satisfied, but we it cannot, it cannot do what only Jesus can do through his Holy Spirit. The Bible says that those who come to God will neither hunger nor thirst. Here's a good question for us. Are our lives filled with dead water that cannot satisfy? Are we continuously searching for things in this world to satisfy the deepest parts of our hearts? Because guess what? We will not find it. Only Jesus Jesus promises living water in John 7, 37 to 39. He said, it says, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit whom those who believed in him would later receive. It says, come to Jesus Come to Jesus if you need this living water that he offers us. He has a better life for you and I. And you know, you see in that verse, it says, let anyone who's thirsty come to me. It doesn't say, let anyone who, if anyone's thirsty, I'll come to you. No, it says, come to me. It takes action from our side. It takes us taking the first step. Come to me and I will give you living water. And number four, Jesus is life-changing. Jesus is life-changing. We cannot experience true salvation and remain the same. We cannot meet Jesus and then still remain the same because Jesus is life-changing. Then maybe we really haven't actually met Jesus if our life is still the same. Because Jesus changes who we are. He changes our desires. He changes every part of us. He's life-changing. And church, there's power in our testimony. There is power in the story of what God has done in your life, in how he's taken you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. There's power in that story when we share that with others. In this story in John 4, once Jesus revealed himself to the Samaritan woman as the Messiah, she was overjoyed. It says she dropped the water buckets. She left everything behind and she ran into the village proclaiming Jesus and saying, come and see the man who, has, who knows everything that I've ever done. Come and see the man who told me everything I've ever done. The woman met a different sort of well and she came away with a different kind of water, turning the attention of an entire village now to Jesus. Isn't that incredible? Just think of how amazing this is. When I read this story over and over, and I just thought, this is incredible. Because remember, she's the outcast. She's the woman who came alone in the dead heat of, of the day to avoid people because they were speaking about her and they didn't want to be seen with her. That's that woman, the one who went alone, who people avoided, who no one paid attention to, who no one listened to. And yet, here she is telling the entire village, come and see what Jesus has done in my life. And guess what? They believed. They believed her. Isn't that incredible? John 4, 39. 
Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, he told me everything I ever did. The power of this woman's testimony brought many to Jesus. Jesus changes our lives, and when he does, we need to tell others. Just think of what amazing things Jesus is waiting to do in and through your life, to share your testimony with others, to tell them of the wonderful things that he's done through your life. Because many others could be saved just because you share your life change story. And we encourage people in our church to come and tell us your testimony because this is something to be celebrated. You never know how your story will impact someone's life. So come share your testimony and we'll do a video and we'll share it with our church, with all of us together because we're all going to be encouraged when we hear each other's stories and how Jesus has changed our lives. And for the saved, for those of us who already have this living water, who know Jesus, who have his spirit within us, here's a question. Do we trust God for our unsaved family and friends? Or do we just, you know, I'm good. I know I'm going to heaven. I'm good with that. And just carry on with our lives and never bother to think or extend or reach out to those around us, our family, our friends, or think, let me just share my story with them. Let me share my testimony. Maybe, maybe God has softened their hearts. Maybe he'll speak to them. And maybe they can experience this incredible life-giving water that Jesus offers them. Jesus, the Bible says, wants everyone saved. He's not a malicious God that's like, oh, you did wrong. Oh, I can't wait to not see you in heaven. No, he's like, please come. Come to me. I have a better life for you. I know what the better way to live is. I know that you belong with me in heaven. Come. That's his heart. He wants everyone saved. And so this morning, church, a reminder that Jesus is unconventional. He hangs out with people we didn't think he would. He's all-knowing yet forgiving. He knows what you've done. He knows your past. He forgives you. He calls you in. He loves you. Jesus is so satisfying. Nothing in this world can satisfy only Jesus. And Jesus is life changing. We cannot ever remain the same once we meet Jesus. And he wants to offer you and I a better way of living. A life that is filled and led and changed by his spirit working within us. A life that is fully satisfied in him and him alone. And a life that testifies to his goodness and his kindness. A life flowing with living water. Amen. Church, why don't we just for a moment, let's close our eyes. Let's just spend some time in God's presence, in prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. Thank you for your presence that is here with us. Thank you for your living water that you offer us. That this world and everything in it can never, never satisfy and fill that void, that hole in our hearts that only you can, Jesus. You know, the Samaritan woman was trying to fill her heart bucket with what the world had to offer, with men and love and approval. Do you this morning find yourself in the same situation? There was the significance of her dropping those water buckets. She left it all behind and she ran into the village, leaving the jars behind. What world-filled jars do you need to leave behind in order to take a hold of the living water? And do you want to accept this living water today? Salvation in Jesus Christ, His power through His Spirit working within you. The only one that can fully quench our thirst and satisfy our hunger. Jesus, only Jesus. And church, if that is you this morning, if you are far from God, if you've never heard of this living water, if you've never experienced this living water, 
never given your life to Christ and realized that he has a better life for you, then I want to encourage you this morning to pray this prayer. And we as a church are going to pray this together. As I pray it, just say it after me. But if you are that person that is reaching out to Christ right now, never experienced his love in this incredible way before, then I want you to pray this prayer from the deepest part of your heart and open up your heart and accept Jesus as your Savior this morning. Let's all pray this together. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins so that I could be forgiven. I need and want your forgiveness. By faith, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your living water and satisfy my thirst. Help me to live a life that will bring you glory. Thank you for coming into my life and for loving me unconditionally. Amen. Well, that was a great reminder of who Jesus is. And two points that stood out to me was Jesus is all-knowing yet forgiving. He knows us. He doesn't just point out our sin to condemn us, but he reveals that he is the Messiah and he offers us a better living, a better way of living. And so let's stand, church, as I share for the benediction. May all go well with you. May you be in good health as it goes well with your soul. May the Lord of peace himself give you his peace at all times and in every situation. May the Lord be with you all. Have a great Sunday, church. Every Sunday you and I come to worship, not just in song, but in our giving as well. And so I wanted to share with you an incredible story that we find in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 25. So the story is King Amaziah. I think, Andrew, I'm going to forget that name. So just remember King Amazing. King Am- you got King, King Amazing. He is the king of Judah, and he wants to go to battle against the Edomites, some of their enemies. And so what he does is he rallies 300,000 soldiers together for an army. Can you picture 300,000? And, and King Amaziah says, it's not enough. So he goes to his neighbor Israel, and he hires an extra 100,000 soldiers. And they're actually warriors, not just soldiers, the Bible says. So now he's 400,000 strong. But the Bible tells us what he paid for those extra 100,000 soldiers. It actually says it's 100 talents, or today, 3,400 kilograms of silver. Now you're thinking, what does that actually mean? I've got a silver ring. I don't know what this thing weighs. I know more or less what it's worth. But 3,400 kilograms of silver, that, that's some weight. So I actually checked yesterday, what is silver trading at? And I worked out that today, 3,400 kilograms of silver would have cost King Amaziah 35 million rand. That's what he paid for 100,000 soldiers. And then this is what we find happened. Verse 7 of chapter 25. But a man of God, God loves to interrupt oh, for good reason. But a man of God came to him and said, Your Majesty, these troops from Israel, this 100,000, must not march with you. For the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the people of Ephraim. Even if you go and fight courageously in battle, God will overthrow you before the enemy. For God has the power to help or to overthrow. So, So King Amaziah is being put to the test here. He's just paid this exorbitant amount for these soldiers, and God's saying no. So is he now going to trust God? Is he going to obey God? Or is he going to go and just do as planned? Verse 9 says this, Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about the hundred talents I paid for these Israelites, all right? Who's with him? You're like, it's 35 million rand, God. We're not just going to write it off. What about it? And so, so we look at a story like this, and we ask ourselves, what is actually happening right here? As we've been speaking through our workshop series the last five weeks on work and money and all these things, we learned that our faith and our finances are inseparable. 
And right in this situation, his faith and his finances are crossing paths, and God's trying to test his heart. Are you going to trust me? Are you going to obey me or not? And, and so he begins to reason, and he says, 35 million rand. And so we can assume that he becomes fearful, right, of writing off this kind of money. Now, we know that fear is the exact opposite of faith. And Scripture says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Now, this story, like none of us are going to battle, right? Hopefully, we never have to go there. But every day, you and I are in a different kind of a battle. In our hearts and in our minds, with the battle of money. When it calls for our attentions, when it calls for us to worship it, and we've got to decide, are we going to respond to God's call, God's invitation to do money His way with faith, or are we going to reason in fear? Let me encourage you with how this ends. Amaziah asked the man of God, but what about the hundred talents that paid for the Israelite troops? The man of God replied, the Lord can give you much more than that. Amen. Listen, Ephesians 3.20 is our vision verse for the year. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than what you can ever ask or imagine, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. He's like 35 million rand. Amaziah, are you kidding me? You think that's anything for God? What counts more is your obedience to God. Will you respond well? And I think that for us, when it comes to giving, when we wrestle, is it going to be fear-based? Is it going to be faith-based? And, and, you know, that was his challenge. But what is the Holy Spirit prompting you to do when it comes to giving, both in and outside the church? God can be trusted. God's not going to put us in a position to harm us. God challenges us so he can bring the best out of us. Amen? And so my encouragement is just to respond well when it comes to giving. And so for anyone who would like to give after service, we do have our giving station and there's different ways that you can go and honor God with. And I just want to, as we close, let you know that on Thursday, we received the email that we, third year in a row, since our launch, received our third clean audit as a church. And so just trying to be above reproach and give you giving confidence in how finances are handled. And so the board is on top of it, and just to let you know. So you can go read the small review. It's on the information desk for those who are interested. Lord, we thank you for your love. Thank you, Lord, that we can compare nothing to your love, your care for us, God. And Lord, I pray that money would never be a master, but only a servant for every one of us. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd help each one of us to trust you and respond in faith, not in fear and in reasoning, knowing that money is almost nothing for you, but we make so much of it. And help us to know how we can worship and please you in the making, spending, saving, and giving of your money, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.